The Stuart Era. Five kings, two queens, two revolutions, and in the middle of the 17th century, Britain's only years of Republican rule. This turbulent period helped to shape modern Britain. So Charles is the now only son. The only son. He's quite young there. It was an era of massive transformations from the development of trade and empire to the emergence of parliamentary democracy and political parties. Setting up kind of a blueprint for the Stuart dynasty. Of course, the Stuart period was shaped by forces other than the Stuarts themselves. And yet, the monarchy was central in a way that is almost unimaginable today. The Stuarts determined when the country would go to war. They forged and broke alliances. And through their control of the church, they held sway over the very souls of their subjects. It's impossible to understand this remarkable period of history without understanding the Stuart monarchs. The literature that was published about the Stuart monarchy was never just about individual kings or queens. Royal family was really important during the Stuart era. The Stuart monarchs came after Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, and the first Stuart king, James VI and I, understood that his family made him much more attractive for his new English subjects. He placed his wife, Queen Anna of Denmark, and his eldest son, Prince Henry, beside him in royal ceremonial like the formal entry pageants when the royal family entered London. Texts were written to or about royal women and the queens, as well as about their children and the monarch. How did the texts that were written about the royal queens compare with the texts that were written about the kings. What themes and images surrounded the Queen, Anna of Denmark, and how do these complement or contradict the language that surrounded James and the fictions for his power? To read these texts and to compare texts that were produced about the Queen's and other Stuart family members across this century, this dynamic century of change, gives us a really good insight to the ways in which people were working through questions about gender, power and authority in Stuart Britain. Which is also an announcement of an idea of his authority, really. The question that really fascinates me is how does literature help us to understand how ordinary people in the 17th century experienced political change. Let's take the example of the restoration of Charles II in 1660. Eleven years after the execution of his father had ushered in a period of republican government, monarchy was restored in Britain. It prompted the publication of an unprecedented volume of literature in which the restoration was celebrated as a divine deliverance. And yet, in this literature, we also see deep-set uncertainties emerging. Who was the man being restored? What sort of a king was he going to be? And how secure was his rule? In the literature of 1660, we can see writers wondering on what the meaning, the shape, and the future of the Stuart monarchy was going to be after the execution of a king and the fall of a republic. It's got a kind of theoretical premise that he's working through within the text rather than... In the Stuart kind of era, there was an explosion of imaginative and political writing. Much of that writing concentrated on moments of regime change. Those writings not only responded to political events, but also shaped their perception among the wider public. And the most important form which did that job was the drama. Think of Shakespeare, and also normally thought of as an Elizabethan. But in fact, much of his writing career falls into the Stuart period. Shakespeare's Hamlet, a play obsessed about regime change, king killing and carnage more generally. The play closes with the accession of the foreign monarch, the Norwegian Fortinbras. What would an early Jacobean audience have made of Hamlet, given that their new king was a foreigner, a Scot. He came from a country traditionally hostile to England. What would they have made of Shakespeare's Macbeth and King Lear, the two extraordinary important tragedies written obviously in response to the Jacobean succession? Macbeth, the Scottish play, which plays on, again, king killing and hereditary monarchy, and King Lear, which addresses another of James's pet projects the Union of England and Scotland. 
I'm really excited about the 17th century. I think mostly because when I applied to university, I'd never studied it at all. And I think that coming here, I realized it's a really interesting period. I think what's really fascinating about this period is how history and English come together. It's a highly political period, and what's interested me is that my conception of what literature is has changed, because now I've realised that actually pamphlets are just as literary as poetry of the period, and poetry is just as political as pamphlets. One of the things that makes the Stuart century so compelling is the amazing variety of materials through which we can study it. Diverse forms of literature, pamphlets, paintings, and artefacts ranging from ceramics through to coins and medals. So how are we to make sense of these diverse materials? Well, here's where Stuart's Online comes in. Stuart's Online's a great new resource bringing cutting edge academic scholarship to the wider public. It includes video podcasts, timelines, and interviews with distinguished historians who help you to make sense of the Stuart successions, the civil wars, and the glorious revolution, and much, much more. So go to www.stuartsonline.com and start exploring the 17th century today.